me again, it's to me, your old buddy, your old pal, your humble narrator. Welcome to the first installment of my true crime series. I decided to take a stab at it. And before we get started, I'd just like to throw out a quick disclaimer that this may be too heavy of a story for sensitive audiences. And I just want to say while I'm recounting the story that I mean absolutely no disrespect to any of the victim's families or anyone else. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoy it. It all started in 1988 with the premiere of America's Most Wanted. This is America's Most Wanted, and I'm John Walsh. Uh, yes, my eight-year-old self would sit about six inches away from the TV like this. Looking at the FBI's 10 Most Wanted right before bed. Anyhow, I've been a true crime junkie ever since. Uh, Forensic Files is my favorite true crime show of all time. Followed by American Justice. Um, I used to read the crime library quite a bit, which was on the Court TV website, which is now known as True TV. Well, when it transitioned from Court TV to True TV, they got rid of the crime library, which was awesome. The crime library was awesome, not the fact that they dumped it. True TV apparently wanted to go in more of a family-friendly direction. Yeah, so they scrapped it. Um, I used to stay up all night and read the damn thing. It was really creepy too, and it included this really gory photo gallery. Um, because, you know, back in like the late 90s, early 2000s, the internet was real loosey-goosey. Like, it was just no holds barred, to be honest. It was, a, you'd be a couple of clicks away from just all kinds of fuckery. So that's just a little bit about yours truly. That's enough about me and my little fangirling. I'm gonna kick off my true crime series with an American serial killer that I don't think has been covered quite enough. You know, we've heard about the Night Stalker, Ted Bundy, Gacy, Dahmer, you know, the usuals, ad nauseum, which is as fascinated as, as I am, just as much as anybody else, just kind of get tired of it, you know? So today I would like to bring forth a story about an American serial killer by the name of Haddon Irving Clark. He was born in well, I've got conflicting sources on this one. So he was either born on July 31st, 1951 or 52. Either way, you know. He was born and raised in Troy, New York. And he was one of four children to Haddon Sr. and Flavia. Now, Haddon grew up in a well-to-do affluent family, actually. His grandfather was the mayor and uh, they lived in this two-story colonial home, like nestled in the woods and it was all badass and everything. Well, Haddon Sr. was a gifted chemist and he was also an engineer at the gas company. Well, fun fact about Haddon Sr., he actually helped develop plastic cling wrap, like saran wrap. Isn't that a trip? And he also helped invent fire retardant carpeting. And uh, Flavia was a homemaker. Sadly, however, they were a couple of raging alcoholics and their household was a shit show. So Haddon was the second of four children. Haddon was the second in line. His older brother was Bradfield and then he had a sister named Allison and a younger brother named Jeffrey. From what I understand, he had kind of a traumatic delivery, wherein he suffered a head injury because he had to be pulled out by forceps, by the head, and suffered some brain damage as a result. So, you know, he hit the earth with brain trauma, which is major. Yeah. Anyhow, Flavia had wanted a girl, and since she didn't get a girl, when she would get super wasted, she would dress Haddon up in girl's clothes and call her Kristen and make her behave like a girl. So as a result, Haddon developed a penchant for women's clothing and for cross-dressing. 
So like I mentioned, the uh, Clark household was volatile and um, you know, there was just physical violence going on, uh, the parents fighting, there was abuse, drugs and alcohol flying around, just dysfunction everywhere you turn over there, right? And as an aside, Haddon Sr. suffered from manic depression. You know, bipolar and schizophrenia and those types of disorders can run in families. There is a genetic component to those, so just something to keep in mind. So Haddon had a rough childhood. He was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. He fell on his head often. He had a speech impediment. He just had a bunch of issues. He lacked social skills. He was a loner. He was weird and he could be very, very cruel and mean. It's like he got off on hurting people. He had a short fuse and would get pissed off really easily. So the neighborhood kids learned to kind of avoid him. And so not only did he suffer his share of being bullied, you know, and alienated for, let's say his speech impediment, his disabilities, things like that. He was also a bully in his own right. He was hypersensitive, insecure, and vindictive as hell. For instance, if he felt slighted by you or by your family, he would go and just take your pet and disappear it, basically, as revenge. He was very much a vengeful person. So due to this long list of issues he suffered, uh, Haddon started school later than most kids would, and he graduated high school at the age of 20. I do want to add that while he was growing up, his father would call him a retard and beat him repeatedly, trying to basically beat the retard out of him. In fact, his dad called him retard so much, Haddon actually thought that was his name for a period of his childhood because he wasn't buying this cerebral palsy diagnosis. So being called the R word going forward was a huge trigger for him, which, you know, of course it would be, right? Especially if you do have some disability. Nobody wants to be called that, you know? So Haddon attended a very prestigious culinary arts institute after high school where he actually got his degree in the culinary arts. He excelled. His cutlery skills were second to none. He just had a talent in the kitchen, so he did very well in the culinary arts. And because he graduated from such a prestigious institution, it was the Culinary Arts Institu Institute of America, um, he had his pick of jobs. So he worked many, many jobs. And part of the reason why he worked so many jobs is because he had trouble holding down jobs due to his horrible attitude, his lack of social skills, his vindictive behavior, such as, well, if he didn't like a customer, for instance, he would take a raging piss into the vat of mashed potatoes and serve them up to customers. He would also chug beef blood in the kitchen in front of his coworkers and gross them the hell out. And it just sounds like this guy wasn't all that fun to be around. You know? So as a result of these types of antics, he had around 14 jobs between the years of 74 and 82. So at the age of 30, he decided to enlist in the Navy and he became a cook on a ship. Well, being the cross-dresser that he was, his shipmates didn't take too kindly to him wearing these frilly lacy panties underneath his uniform. So he got his ass beat on the regular. Well, on um, one such occurrence, he got his ass beat so bad that he blacked out and had a concussion and had to go to the hospital, basically. Well, while he was in the hospital, he was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. A couple of features of paranoid schizophrenia are delusions of persecution, where you think everybody's out to get you, everybody's after you, everybody hates you, everybody's trying to sabotage you, or you're being followed people are talking behind your back, etc. And uh, another feature could be uh, delusions of grandeur, where while you're so damn paranoid, you're also feeling really cocky that you're smarter than everybody. You got everybody's number, you know more than everybody. It's kind of a nasty combination if you think about it. 
Another feature is hallucinations. Not only did Haddon talk to himself quite a bit, but he talked to the animals and apparently they talked back. Now, schizophrenia is tricky in that it tends to creep up a little bit later in life, like in your late 20s and early 30s. However, I would imagine that there could be environmental triggers that could kind of bring it on, such as hmm, having tumultuous relationships, beatings, head injuries, um, lots of stress, things like that. So Haddon received treatment uh, for his diagnosis and was medically discharged from the Navy in 1985. So let's take a minute to rewind to 1984. Haddon's older brother Bradfield had his own demons. Bradfield was quite the walking shit show in his own right. In 1984, he invited a coworker that he apparently had a crush on over for some dinner. And she was supposed to bring her husband, she was married, but he couldn't come. She decided to go anyway. He made a pass at her and was rebuffed. He didn't like that, a struggle ensued and he wound up bashing her head into a brick wall, strangling her, dismembering her, chopping off her breasts and barbecuing them and eating them. Well, apparently his guilt was so heavy on him that he wound up turning himself into the police and was given 18 years to life in prison. So in 1986, a few things happened. The death of Haddon Sr. He committed suicide in 1986. Also in 1986, Haddon went to go live with his brother Jeffrey in Silver Spring, Maryland. Me again, correction. He went to go live with his brother in 1985 and was asked to move out in 1986 due to his escalating outrageous behavior such as talking to himself, he was angry all the time, he was agitated, it just got to be too much. He also had a bail Haddon out of jail for stealing from freaking Kmart so he could look like Kathy Lee Gifford. Jeffrey had three kids, and as you can imagine, his antics continued during the course of his stay with his brother Jeff. Well, the last nail in the coffin for Haddon living with his brother Jeff is when Jeff caught him masturbating in front of his niece and nephew. So he kicked his ass out. So between getting kicked out and his niece calling him a retard every time he turned around, which was his big trigger word, Haddon was over the top boiling pissed. So here we are on May 31st, 1986. And just a couple of doors down from the Clark residence, we have the home of Carl Dorr. Well, Carl Dorr was in the middle of a nasty custody battle with his ex-wife, but was having visitation with his six-year-old daughter, Michelle Dorr, nonetheless. So it's that time of year where it's getting hot and Carl decided to set up a cute little waiting pool for Michelle to go and play in in the backyard. So she's got her pink, ruffly little bathing suit on and she's out there having fun. And he decides to go inside and watch some big auto race, right? Well, I guess he lost track of time. He got really like involved in his television program and who knows, doing a crossword, I don't know. And hours went by and he looked out the window for his daughter and realized she wasn't there. Well, back in the 80s, the alarm bells didn't go off immediately when your child wasn't in the home, uh, especially if they had like a bunch of neighborhood friends that they would often play with, which was the case. It was the 80s. Kids would just take off all damn day long on their bikes, playing around, throwing rocks, running in the alley, just terrorizing the neighborhood until it was almost dark and they had to come inside, you know? Um, Michelle and Haddon's niece, Eliza, often played together 
So Carl assumed that Michelle went over there to go play with Eliza. So he wasn't terribly worried at first, you know? Well, around 5.30 p.m., Michelle was still nowhere in sight. So Carl started canvassing the neighborhood looking for his daughter. He went over to the Clark's house and thought, she's gotta be here playing with Eliza. Well, it turns out that Jeff nor Eliza had seen her all day long. So the panic ensues. So Carl went straight to the police station, reports are missing, and over the next week, police are canvassing the neighborhood. They sent out cadaver dogs. They're interviewing all the neighbors. And when they get to the Clark household, Jeffrey says, look, don't gloss over my brother in this interviewing process. Um, the guy's freaking crazy. So I highly suggest you take a strong look at him. Well, they did. They hauled Haddon in for questioning and they interrogated him for like six hours, really shook him down. Well, during the interrogation, they showed him a picture of Michelle and he totally broke down. He's crying, he's shaking, it's a big old scene. He runs to the bathroom and throws up. He says that he may have done something to her, but he doesn't remember, he has blackouts. So basically a partial confession up in here. How loving and patient he must be, he's still working on me. Everyone who knows him is convinced he would kill again. Unfortunately, Carl also underwent a brutal interrogation process. For hours and hours and hours, he was just absolutely grilled. Once the police found out that there was a lot of drama going on between him and his ex-wife, especially over Michelle, and that she had just jacked up the child support payments that he didn't want to pay. Um, when he took her that weekend, he told the ex-wife, well, you know, she might not even come back, you know, things like that. They were like, oh, we're done. We got him, you know? So they grilled him for hours and hours and, you know, you know how they can lie during the interrogation and uh, they give him uh, two polygraph tests. He failed the first one and then he passed the second one. He underwent hypnosis. He took a freaking truth serum and the police still didn't believe him. You have insisting, you know, you've done something. I know you've done something with Michelle and, and we're going to find her body. And, and when we find her body, I'm coming to get you is what he told me. Point blank, finger in the face, you know, in my face, screaming, yelling. So it got to the point where Carl was so freaking broken down that he confessed to abducting and murdering his child. So even though they had this freak, Haddon, they were so fixated on Carl that they weren't taking it as seriously as they should. Also, the timing of Michelle's disappearance was miscalculated. And because of that miscalculation, Haddon Clark was set loose because he clocked in for work at 2.46 p.m. that day at the Chevy Chase Country Club where he was working in the kitchen. I wonder if he was fired from Wally World. Anyhow, because Carl was so stressed out and got the timeline all fumbled up, that served as Haddon's alibi, him clocking into work at 2.46. Well, Carl wound up recanting his confession. They didn't really have any evidence against him. So between that and cutting Haddon loose, the case went ice cold for years. So after Haddon's discharge from the Navy and subsequent discharge from his brother's house, he, you know, was bouncing around once again from job to job. He was often homeless. He would live in the woods, live in his car, he would often steal from Kmart, women's clothing, shoes, purses, things like that. He once dressed up as a woman and went uh, to a church. And while the women's choir was doing their thing, he stole their purses, their coats to add to his arsenal of women's paraphernalia for his cross-dressing addiction. Apparently he regularly attended Bible study and came to church for the social aspect and for the lunches. 
as he was well known in the homeless community. He was seen as industrious and crafty, dying to be socially accepted, yet was super awkward, so he couldn't really make it work. He stole from his former landlord. He defaced property. When Haddon was evicted from the premises, he took some fish heads and put them in the piano, put them in the stove, put them in the chimney, and just places that where they're kind of hard to find. But once you do find them, it's too late anyway because it's like baked into the walls. And when he split, he set up a booby trap. Um, so he put some black oil into a can and set it up on the door uh, such that when somebody walked in, it, it would just dump all over them and everywhere. So he was just jacking up the place. I think he also put some fish heads in a neighbor's car as well. What a little bastard. So each time he was caught, charged, convicted of any of these crimes, petty theft, burglary, defacing property, assault. He also had a gun charge on him at one point. He was pulled over and caught with a gun. He also had a wig and some women's clothing in there in which he responded to the cop, I'm a woman. He assaulted his mother, for instance. Um, he was stealing from her. And when she confronted him, he got really pissed off, assaulted her, tried to run her over with his car. And once again, probation, 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 every single damn time. I think he did 45 days once. He was institutionalized uh, a few times and, you know, medicated for his mental illnesses. He, he'd be medicated for a little while and then he would peace out and just get back on with his bad self. So despite the pleas of his probation officer to have him institutionalized for a long period of time, it just never happened. And this guy just slipped through the cracks, the cracks in the system and just slithered his way out of there every single damn time. And, and it's gonna keep on happening throughout this story, man. So for the next several years, Haddon continues his bullshittery all over the East Coast of petty thefts and vandalism, burglary, dressing up like Dolly Parton, doing odd jobs anywhere he could. He had burned so many bridges that he couldn't get a real job anymore, basically. So in 1992, he was a gardener for a woman named Penny Hodling in Bethesda, Maryland. He did such a great job at gardening and got along really well with Penny, actually, to the point where she trusted him so much that he had the run of the house. Her daughter was away at college, so it was basically just her and Haddon hanging around the house. Well, in October of 1992, Laura Hodeling, was, who was the daughter of Penny Hodeling, came home. She graduated from Harvard. She was a badass. She was starting her career. She really was a gifted woman. She was super intelligent and sweet. She was six foot tall, like she was to be reckoned with. Well, things came to a fever pitch when Laura got home because Haddon felt like, now that Laura's here, Penny doesn't really need me. Like. I think in a sense, he felt like he was her daughter and he liked having the run of the place. And now that Laura was home, he wasn't really getting that attention anymore. And you know, a lot of this is going on in his head, I'm sure. Haddon had been systematically stealing things from the Hodeline household as well, such as underwear, jewelry, tools, things like that. Well. Finally, Penny became hip to it and confronted Haddon about stealing tools. So, of course, that pissed him off royally on top of the fact that he felt like he was kind of being replaced or something. So on October 18th, 1992, Penny was away at a conference. So Laura was the only one at the house. Uh, even though she had a brother that would come and visit, they'd hang out, watch movies, etc. At night, you know, she was all by herself and probably feeling nice, safe, comfortable, you know? Well, that night, Haddon dressed up as a woman, 
tiptoed his way into the hodling house, went into Laura's room and woke her up with his gun. And he said something to the effect of, why are you in my bed? And she's like, you know, could you, I just, oh God, I, God, I couldn't imagine. And she's like, what? And he's like, tell me I'm Laura. So she's confused. Well, she's like, shit, I'm going along with this, you know? It's like, yeah, you're Laura, you know? Please don't hurt me. Well, he wound up making her take a shower, tied her up by her, her wrists and her ankles. And according to some sources, he was duct taping her face so crazily, rigorously, excitedly, that he wound up just duct taping her whole face and she suffocated. This piece of... When he went to cut the duct tape off of her, he wound up slashing her neck. So it's either that or he just straight up slashed her neck and stabbed her. And that's how he killed her in the first place. So, well, he decided he liked her earrings. So he cut them off of her, took them. He stole her class ring and a crystal unicorn. And then he got into bed with her body and slept there soundly. So at eight in the morning, he rolled out of there through the front door like nothing. Well, he's wearing full on women's clothing and a wig. So a neighbor saw him, her, and thought it was Laura leaving for work. And that was reportedly the last time she was ever seen, was leaving for work that morning. So once investigators start looking around and canvassing the area and sending out the cadaver dogs and the whole nine yards, they found a bloody pillowcase out in the woods, not very far away from Laura's house. The bloodhounds that they had with them picked up the scent and led the investigators back to Laura's house. So they knew that that was Laura's pillowcase. Well, while they were checking around in her room, they took a hairbrush that was full of hair as evidence. And they also saw that there was blood all on the mattress on the right side. So of course, during the investigation, they're interviewing everybody, speaking with everybody. And they come to find out that Haddon Clark was the part-time gardener at the Hodeline household. And the alarm bells sound off. And this is only, gosh, I think it's within 10 miles of the door residence. So the light bulb shines bright in these investigators' faces and they're like, that son of a bitch. So they see he's got a record, right? And they obtain a warrant to search his storage unit in Rhode Island that he would rent out by the year. So there was a bunch of crazy shit in there, including all sorts of women's clothing, full on outfits, shoes, wigs, jewelry, the whole nine yards, right? He also kept Laura Hodeline's queen-size bloodied sheets in that shed so that he can go back and smell them. Well, while they're looking through all his crap, they find a wig that looks eerily similar to a synthetic hair that was picked off of Laura Hodeline's hairbrush that they took for evidence. It had a bunch of her hair in it and one synthetic hair that was found on there that they decided to keep an eye on, right? Well, when they compared the two hairs, they were completely identical in every way. Well, there was also one bloody fingerprint left behind on the pillowcase that was found by Laura Hodeline's house, right? Which actually belonged to her. And they lucked out with a print. Haddon's print, to be clear. Clark confesses and pleads guilty to second degree murder of Laura Hodeling, which he was given 30 years for. Which by the way, Laura Hodeling's body was found in the woods right by her home. So they did recover her body. And I believe it was within eight months of the murder that they, that he led them to her body. And while he was in prison for the murder of Laura Hodeling, he was bragging and boasting to other inmates about how he killed all these other women. Women and girls, I should say. Including Michelle Dorr. So he specifically confesses to this one inmate that looks like Jesus. He's got the long hair, long bushy beard, and Haddon liked to confess his sins to this guy. So he would tell Jesus literally everything. He 
he would talk about all these murders he committed between 1973 and 1991, and that he killed all these chicks. And um, one chick, he cut her hands off at the wrist and buried her in the sand dunes and used her fingers as fish bait on Cape Cod. So Haddon wound up confessing to as many as 12 murders. So the inmates that he had confessed Michelle Dore's murder to went and narked on him, right? When interrogated about Michelle Dore's disappearance for the second time, Haddon Clark outright refused to speak to police about her in any way, shape, or form. I know what's going on. I'm not talking about nothing, because my lawyer told me not to. I told you honestly, I wouldn't, I asked some of your questions, whatever you want to ask, but some questions I'm not going to answer. That's just the way it is. They go back to where Jeffrey Clark once lived, two doors down from the Doors residence. Um, there's a new family there now, but the investigators go in to the house and up to what used to be Eliza's bedroom. And they find remnants of blood underneath the wooden slats. It was like a wooden floor. And even throughout all the cleanings over you know, all these years, there were still these bloody remnants underneath the slats that they were able to pull DNA from. It's freaking badass. So they find out that that's the blood of Michelle Dore. What the hell is the blood of Michelle Dore doing in Haddon Clark's house, right? So everything is coming together. Clark confesses. Interestingly, when Clark does confess to these murders, he claims his alter ego, Kristen, did it, and he alternates between a woman's voice and an infant's voice. Clark says, fine, I'll lead you to the body of Michelle Dore, but I got to take Jesus with me and I have to wear women's clothing. So the police go to Kmart and get him an outfit. So each time Haddon's leading the police around to different sites to look for bodies, he's wearing this outfit and complaining that the skirt's too large and it's just all this. He had to be cute while he was looking for his victims. A hole. So in January of the year 2000, they find Michelle's body out in the woods in a shallow grave covered by just a random discarded mattress. Well, it is my understanding that that's not the initial place that he buried her. He had initially buried her at his family's burial plot, um, his grandfather's burial plot and his own burial plot. He had buried her there initially, and then he got freaked out. So on Halloween of 1992, he went and got her and moved her to this spot that was eventually discovered in the year 2000 when him and Jesus and the police went and found it where she was. So not only was this <laughs> sentenced to 30 years for Laura Hodeling's murder, he was also sentenced to 30 years for the murder of Michelle Dore. How can you not suspect this guy? 1986 if you even you know spend an afternoon with him you, know, you don't have to go to Kmart to figure out he's crazy and the terms are to run consecutively so he's and then he also got an extra 10 years for all these burglaries and robberies and property this and that all this other shit that he had previously been getting slaps on the wrist for so he's in prison for 70 years he's still rotting in prison and today he's almost 70 years old. So in the spirit of being thorough here, back in 1986, when Michelle Dore went over to see if Eliza was home to play, unfortunately Haddon was the only one home at the time and he was boiling mad and took it out on an innocent little girl. He said, yeah, sure, come on in. She's upstairs playing with her dolls. Why don't you go up and see her? So she did, and he followed her with a 12-inch chef's knife. And he wound up slashing and stabbing her. And I am happy to say that she bit the shit out of his hand during this struggle, and I hope it hurt like holy hell. 
So Haddon had a penchant for necrophilia as well. Fortunately, in this case, he was unsuccessful at his attempt. But he was also cannibalistic. And from what I understand, that was in fact successful. So once again, 70 years in prison, unfortunately, the police were never able to find any other evidence or other bodies, skeletal remains. They weren't able to corroborate any of his other stories. One of those murders that he allegedly committed was uh, the Lady of the Sand Dunes, which is an unsolved murder from, I believe, the 70s. Well, Haddon tried to take responsibility for that, but when they went to go check out the sand dunes, they had shifted too much and they couldn't find shit. However, police did discover a bucket full of women's jewelry on Haddon's grandfather's estate. The bucket also included Laura Hodeline's stolen jewelry from the scene of the crime. The bucket contained over 200 pieces of jewelry that were allegedly from Haddon's victims. Which sucks, because it would be nice to get some more murder solved. Honestly, even though investigators are kind of like, sometimes he's super truthful, other times he's fucking with us. You know, they don't trust him, which of course, why should you trust him? However, my gut tells me that he's probably telling the truth about a lot of these other murders. I, I believe it. Unfortunately, I believe it. I think he's that much of a sick and twisted. Thank you for listening. God bless Carl Dorr his ex-wife, Penny Hodling, and all the other people that this impacted. And it is of my opinion that the system failed in several ways with regards to this case, these victims, and even Haddon himself. He should have been institutionalized 40 years ago. Thanks for coming to my first true crime video. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope everybody stays safe out there, all right? Tune in next time. And may I offer you a sub sandwich? And I will talk to you later. Thanks again.